Respect is such a core value to us because when we're respected, it means that we're viewed as having value to our tribe. And when you're valued by your tribe, um, you're protected. Hmm. And if you're disrespected, you're not listened to, it means you don't have value. You're not perceived as having value. And that means actually that you're expendable. I'd like to move into talking a bit about this book you wrote here. Uh, and so true confessions, I did not tell you this. So the title, Carrots and Sticks Don't Work. Build a culture of employee engagement with the principles of R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Did you hear it playing? I did. Last song. Yeah, yeah was... the respect, Aretha Franklin. Thank you. Dan put that on. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, and when I, when I first started reading, I said, oh, okay, this is going to be another one of these books that's light and breezy, and after about four pages, I'm going to get the whole thing, and I don't really need to read it. So I'm on the airplane. You can see I got my tea, and I'm reading it. And if you look carefully, you'll see I have about 20 dog-eared pages. I've underlined things. It, it's one of the most thoughtful management guidance leadership books I've read in a long time. So I, I, I say that uh, with um, sincerity. Uh, and I also was struck by the way you called out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the phoniness that's out there for leadership advice and counsel mm -hmm. and some of the consulting uh, tools that aren't really good tools. They're just someone's ideas uh, that really aren't uh, reliable and so forth. So, um, but what, what, tell us what the thesis of this book is. I mean, the title is great. It kind of tells the story. But what's the thesis of this? Because one of the, Paul's PhD was in motivation. So how do we motivate people? Which maybe is the wrong question, I think, yeah, you yeah, say. Yeah. Well, unpack this a little bit. Why, is, why was your old PhD studying something that's the wrong question? Um, so when we, when we think about motivating people in, in the workplace, the image that I always have is uh, one of those Mickey Mouse wind-up toys, right. right? And so my job as a manager or a leader is to motivate people, right? Inspire them to run around, right? Real quick. And the problem with that, of course, is that people unwind. Hmm. And that I don't want to be in the game of trying to continually wind them up. What I want them is to have a really internal sense of engagement. And talked about some this morning, the idea of, of purpose. Um, of mission, and certainly if you talk to anybody in the millennials, they'll talk to you, they'll say um, how important that is to them, um, to feel that sense of connectedness. And I have found in my work and my research that the number one driver of engagement is the extent to which people take pride in their work. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud to say that I work for. Mm. And so uh, using my whiteboard, I was asked to give a talk on motivating employees in the 21st century, and I had my whiteboard and I had all my motivational slides and what I realized was that I was going to bore people to death um, during this <laughs> talk. Um, and so I used my whiteboard to really try to identify what's, for me, the, the, just the core theme of engaging people and right. it was treating people with respect. Hmm. And I do this work um, not just because I think that we deserve respect, and it's certainly a message in, in the Bible, um, and actually, it, on that, just because yeah. yeah, the, the, that's I think a really profound thing that respect is. It's it's throughout the the Hebrew and Christian texts that, that of this respect of of treating people. Because if you take the thesis that we are all all created in the image of God, yeah. and we have a little bit of God in us, however flawed we might be, that would suggest well, I kind of ought to be respectful to that little bit of God in you. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it's if profound. you if, if you think about the Ten Commandments, I mean, they're all related to respect in some way. Yeah. Yeah, they're relational. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. But so, so talk a bit more about that. So, because it, it came out of your research, it wasn't just an aha moment. Yeah, it was, yeah. So it's empirically grounded as well as you connected the dots with your whiteboarding. That respect is, if there's one lever, that's the one? I think so. I think so. And if, if you want to consider, so I was really, I think you've written David's book here as well. And I think um, when we write a book, uh, we, we sincerely have no idea whether anyone other than our family members who feel compelled to will buy a copy and read it. My mother bought it's, three copies, well, I want to let well, you know. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm not sure if my mom, yeah, my mom, my mom was wonderful. Um, but it's, it's been, again, I'm very blessed. It's been translated in several different languages. It's even been translated into Farsi and it's sold in Iran. Um, but <laughs> that the, is pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, um, I don't get any royalties on that, uh, not surprisingly. <laughs> So, though that respect is so universal, 
Um, and in almost any world religion, you find certainly right. respect for uh, God. Um, but what I, what I took away is that respect is such a core value to us because when we're respected, it means that we're viewed as having value to our tribe. And when you're valued by your tribe, um, you're protected. Hmm. And if you're disrespected, you're not listened to, it means you don't have value. You're not perceived as having value. And that means actually that you're expendable. Hmm. And so um, and, and, and it really is, on, uh, it actually is a matter of life and death, if you hmm. think about it. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, dueling. So until late 1800s, you know, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, I am willing to kill you or be killed by you in order to restore some sense of honor and respect, certainly in uh, Eastern cultures, or Asian, willing to commit ritual suicide to restore honor and respect. The gang members killing one another over nothing but an issue of respect of colors and turf. And um, many wars and revolutions um, grounded in respect for human beings, such as the, um, the American Civil War. Do you think much about if, if you disrespect someone, whether it's intentionally or accidentally? Because yeah. we can sometimes yeah. inadvertently, we're going too fast, we're in our own yeah. zone, we're just not paying attention. Um, how do you restore respect? Have you thought about that? Like if you've intentionally or unintentionally disrespected yeah. someone, how do you like rebuild it? Well, I think one of the biggest issues is that we often don't know when we have disrespected somebody. Hmm. We engage in activities, or a lot of times we don't engage in activities um, that lead to a, a sense of feeling disrespected because it's not average people don't say, especially to their boss, hey, you've done something that I feel disrespected about. And it could be as simple as, but as impactful as walking by somebody in the hallway and just not lifting up your head hmm. and saying hello. Hmm. And you know, respect is such a cultural issue as well. Um, so, Having been born in New Jersey, um, I think the New Jersey attitude is, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Um, you know, when I was in uh, Davidson College in North Carolina, if you walked by somebody on the street, it would be considered rude to not say hello, good morning. Mm. And then of course up in uh, New Haven, um, when you walk by and said hello or good morning to somebody, they like clutch their small children, because that's just not <laughs> part of the culture um, that we live in. <laughs> And so, R, so you spell out R E S P E C. I can't say it without sort of wanting to do Aretha. But it, of the, so he's made an acronym out of respect, and each of the words means so. Of the, we won't unpack each one, but yeah. of the uh, acronym respect, which letter to you is, are there one or two that are most helpful mm. for, for those of us who maybe haven't read the book yet or haven't thought, by the way, you can get a copy at the front and Paul will sign it for you if you want. Oh, one or two that would be uh, ones that we should know about? I'll take the first and the last. Okay, um, so the R and the T. So, yeah, so um, the R is for just recognize, recognition. So recognizing, acknowledging people for the contributions that they make. And I think most people, if you didn't, there, there are handouts. Um, but I, I think- uh, Which one are you referring us to? The, yeah. Uh, this the, is the uh, Leadership Qualities of Jesus Christ? Is yeah, okay. and so, um, uh, these are ones that just really resonated for me, and I, 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 David and I spoke, this is a wonderful for me because it really made me think about my faith in relation to my work. And so, uh, you know, among the, the passages that I've highlighted and thought you might take this with you on the, on the back of the, the page, um, 1 Thessalonians, um, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work, live in peace with each other. Um, and honestly, I don't think, so carrots and sticks don't work. Um, if anybody has an employee of the month kind of thing, um, it actually demotivates people and there's a lot of research around that. Um, it's just simply, you know, thank you for the contribution that you are. And I think that that's- Got some more props really, for here. Oh, thank you. Do yes. these work, do these yes, work? they work, they work, <laughs> anybody wants them. I'll bring these back to the donkeys um, on the farm. Um, and I'll use this in my garden for the tomato plants. Um, but you know, I think there's something very dehumanizing when we talk about, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead you with this. And if you don't do what I want, I'm gonna beat you with this. And we know that those things will lead to very short-term changes in Because it can work for a period sometimes, right? Uh, motivated to make a little more money or whatever, um, 
or fear of punishment. For, yeah, I mean, they right. are motivators, in, um, but not sustainable is what you're saying. No, and really, and it depends on, it, there are very specific circumstances under which if you're on an assembly line, um, carried is, you know, the wages that you make and putting it out there. But there's, again, there's a tremendous amount of research that says giving people bonuses and such um, have very short-term impact on their actual behavior. Right. So, so I think fundamentally just recognizing, acknowledging one another for the contributions. And I, I, I will, if, so I was in Port Authority, uh, this is going back a couple of years, and I had time, I live in a very small town called Three Bridges, New Jersey, which only has one bridge, and we're <laughs> ambitious. <clears throat> and so there, I was waiting for the bus, which comes every other day, and, um, <laughs> There's a little, the, the brewery that's in there, Heartland Brewery, if you're familiar with, of course. And I'd gone in the middle of the afternoon, and there was this gentleman who served me, you know, late lunch. And, you know, I always have so much respect for people when, no matter what their job is, they do the best to their ability. And this gentleman was truly just, like somebody who looked at me and actually said, um, you know, how, how's your day? Hmm. And he meant it. And he really, he did, he meant hmm. it. How was your day? And then he said, you know, if you don't like anything you get, bring it back. And he was just very friendly and very positive. I'm thinking, you know, this gentleman who's in his 50s when he was a teenager certainly didn't aspire to be a waiter in Port Authority. So the check comes and I read on the, on the bottom of it, uh, you know, John, thanks so much for your great service, your you know, positive attitude. You really made my day. And so I saw him and he walked over to the register and opened um, the billfold and sort of did a double take. Hmm. And then he did something with it. Anybody want to guess what he did with it? He, he, he showed it to um, the, the maitre d'. He showed it to somebody he worked with, right? Who looked at it and said, that's really nice. You should keep it. Hmm. And so can you imagine how little acknowledgement we must get in the world that a note scribbled by a total stranger would be hmm. worth showing to somebody else? Hmm. So I, I just encourage people to think uh -huh. about the fact that you can be a contribution to people, that you can let them know the contribution they are to you every day. You know, go to go through Port Authority and thank the folks in the military or uh, police, and you know, because of what you do, I can do what I do, right? Keep my family safe. So, just think about how sad it is that how little people say thank you, mm. and how we get that opportunity every day to make that difference for someone. No, I appreciate it. that's powerful, powerful. Yeah. And how about the T? What's the T stand for in your acronym? So trust. You know, and you can talk about trust in relationship to faith, right? Mm -hmm. Trust in God, mm -hmm. that he will serve us and guide us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, trust is like respect. I think without a, a fundamental sense of trust, um, there's no relationship. I think about trust in the way I would a, like a porcelain piggy bank. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a relationship that's ongoing. And so through experiences, I put a dime, you put a quarter. We go back and forth. We build up this bank of trust. And then it's incredibly fragile, though, mm. because if I find anything that um, I've done that is, it, I, I feel distrusted, uh, there's, a, there's a break in trust somehow. It's like mm. dropping that porcelain piggy bank, and it shatters into a thousand pieces, and it's really hard to put back together again. Um, you think about this in your personal life as well as professional life. And then once that trust is gone, as a manager or a leader, it leads to all kinds of things like micromanaging people. It kills initiative. And, shows a lack of respect and all those right. kinds of things. So fostering a sense of trust mm. in your ind individual and, and organizational culture. And I can see how that ties into respect, because if, if you have a breach of trust, it hurts respect. Like these are sort of inter, there could be positive or negative circles or cycles that come out. In fact, Grant, when we interviewed Grant Gregory, uh, what, year, two years ago, that one of the things you talked about was a reservoir of trust, I think was the word you used, that's just foundational yeah. to sustained uh, top quality leadership. Uh, so it's interesting that that comes comes back again. Um, anything else from this book before we shift into this new area you're researching of of uh, that, that you want to share with us that could be relevant? Yeah. I, I think or the a one story or a yeah, concept is this idea of an actionable philosophy. An actionable philosophy. That sounds like a mouthful. What's yeah. That? So an actionable philosophy. So I think about the respect model um, as a, almost a, a philosophy. It's about how you live your life. But it, it's also about, you gotta put actions behind, you gotta put behaviors behind your beliefs or they're pretty meaningless. <laughs> so you can say that you're a Christian or a philanthropist or an environmentalist, you can say those things. But if you don't actually act according to whatever the principles are, mm. you know, what, what good is it? Mm. You know, what's, 
what's the real meaning behind it? And so I, I one very quick story is I remember working with a gentleman named Jimmy, and Jimmy was this very toxic kind of person in the in the organizational culture. And you've never had a toxic person in your organization? Never. Have you? no, no, right. He was really a, a bad dude, and it was always well, why you know I always get so frustrated. You know why are you keeping Jimmy? And of course the answer is you know well he's so good technically. Right, we can't possibly can't live without him. Can't live without, or it's the guy who makes all the money. Can't possibly live without this. Guy. So um, I'm working with him, and we go out for a cup of coffee. All we're talking about is respect, right? That's that's what we're talking about. And so we go get this cup of coffee, and he's really rude to the the server. And I look at him, and I go, you know, Jimmy, what the heck was that? And he looks at me, this light bulb goes off. He goes, you mean I'm supposed to respect everybody? <laughs> I like that's yeah this that's how that works. Huh. So to just consider that I'm certainly not elevating the respect to the, you know, uh, being a religion, but just always think about um, if our belief, if our faith is being Christians, mm -hmm. um, then what does that really look like? That's why we brought this. Um, what does it look like on Ooh, nice. the playing field? All right. What's it look like on the playing field? And that's what matters. So I'm hoping that you enjoy your time together here. But I also hope that you take something, as you do it every time, I'm sure you have a meeting, something from this room and put it on the playing field of your life, personally and professionally. Yeah. No, it's a great, it's a great image. Because uh, in the book of John and some others, talks about that if it's just words, it ain't good enough. Uh, it's got to somehow operationalize and happen, which can mean doing some uncomfortable things, mm. which maybe leads us into yeah. our next topic that you've been spending a lot of time researching, thinking about, and yeah. writing a new book on, on what I would call difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. It could be with our partner, spouse, uh, children, boss, coworker. Yeah. What's this project about? It sounds yeah. fascinating. Um, so does anybody have anybody in their life that if you saw them in the grocery store, you'd put your head down and walk to another aisle or <laughs> pretend to be on a cell phone, you know, that, just that person that we're avoiding in our life. Um, and it could be, a, you know, sadly a family member. Um, many of us have stories where, you know, great aunt Lucy left, you know, aunt Susie off a guest list, they think, and they were, you know, horribly offended by it, and it turns out she had the wrong mailing address, but it took 20 <laughs> years to figure that out. Um, and in fact- I just I'm, had one of those in my family, and in fact, they had the correct mailing address and left them off, so <laughs> that, that one hits home. Hits home. Yeah. But, but, you know, um, and I'll share a personal story. My, my, my father had an older brother, mm -hmm. and um, they get into an argument and disagreement and didn't speak for four, 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. And I never met my only uncle. I've never met my first cousins. Um, I've actually reached out to them uh, mm -hmm. as recently as this summer, uh, and sadly, they just have no interest in getting to know me. Wow. Um, Ouch. Yeah. So. Wow. Um, but I think we all have experiences in which we feel there are conversations that would be beneficial to be had with people, um, to clean stuff up, hmm. you know, that would actually make a difference. Uh, and we often avoid having those conversations. We say things to ourselves like, it's not gonna make a difference. Right. Um, in fact, it could make things worse. Mm. Um, you know, so we're sort of, what's the point of all of this? Um, sometimes even we'll blame ourselves for the problem in, in the case of sometimes, unfortunately, uh, abused spouses, right? right? So I deserve being treated like this. Mm. So um, what I got really interested in was um, if it is all about communication and relationships, um, how are we able to take what would be those difficult conversations and actually have it that, such that it, it does make a difference in, in cleaning things up and moving forward and restoring trust mm. and restoring respect? Mm. You know, how do we actually do that? I, and so my work is all about putting it on the playing field. And um, one of the, the handouts you have is um, 42 tips on how to do that. Yeah. 42 tips. 42 All right, tips. hang on. What's, that's this one here. I'm going to quiz you, David, on them later. <laughs> so, Difficult conversations, strategies for turning confrontation into collaboration. Well, even the way you title it suggests something, that, that a working assumption is it's going to be a confrontation. Yeah. It's going to be my adrenaline's already flowing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm scared, angry first before I even start. Yeah. And you're suggesting something else, aren't you? Yeah, it really, it really is a mindset. It really is, and this could be, again, it's personal and professional. 
So put it on your playing field. Um, my mother has a macular degeneration, the wet kind. For 25 years, she's been getting shots directly into her eye. <laughs> So uh, this is just very recent for me. So um, a couple of days ago, my mom woke up and the world was blurry. She's blind in one eye, has a good eye though, and it was very blurry. And her, her doctor um, had decided to elongate her treatments from four to six to eight weeks. Mm. Now, if you have a mom, which you do, um, God bless her, she's still alive, um, and she's now looking at going blind. Mm. Um, this is something that is just nauseating, you know. So I went to her this week to the clinic, and I was just furious, furious, like mm. nauseous, furious. Mm. And I had in my mind this was going to be a confrontation with the doctor, with the doctor, about the treatment because side. he decided after 25 years to change treatment because maybe it had something to do with the insurance. Yeah, or I was whatever. just thinking that, yeah, right, yeah, because it's incredibly expensive. And so I had this mindset, you know, and I got all pent up about it, you know, mm. and and fortunately I was able to just let that go. Because you, know, yeah, you are the difficult conversation. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. But you know, if you think about too being a Christian, like giving some of that up, right, and giving some of that up. <laughs> nice. And so um, you know, it just turned into. I just took it to a conversation and came from a place of you know love and care. Hmm. And um, and he was great. You know, many of us maybe have grown up in families uh, that you just you had passive aggressiveness or you didn't talk about difficult issues. Yeah. They were suppressed. That was sort of what I grew up in. And then we have stereotypes of other families, like a big Italian family where everyone yells and screams and you talk about everything as a stereotype. Uh, if you don't come out of a, a family tradition that, that can do these rough and tumble conversations, mm -hmm. Are there one or two tips you'd give us from your research out of these 42 that can, like, let's say I'm frankly scared and I, and I don't yeah. know how to go about it. What, what would you say? You know, um, well, can you think of a story of someone you've interviewed and something, someone yeah. who might fit that profile and, and what sort of unlocked them to have them do it? Let me, let me say this first. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, they'll say having these kinds of conversations takes courage. Right. right, you have to have courage because you have to overcome fear. Yeah. I, I say it takes being tired. <laughs> I say just it takes being tired of the way things are. Mm. Mm. Right, it takes being tired of avoiding that person. Right, it, it's um, and by the way, if, if it's especially if it's personal or professional, and you think it's about us having a difficult conversation and, and relationship issue, guess what? It's also about everybody else around you mm. and the impact that it has. So I think the, the first place, as a, as a starting point, is one of the tips is you come from the place of, you know, I really care about you, and I care about our relationship, mm. and that's why I'm having this conversation. Mm. And you have, you have to come from that place. Since you said, I, I, I stumbled into doing that accidentally. The other day I had a conversation with a family member, and I said, I want to say something that's going to be hard for me to say and maybe hard for you to hear, but because I love you and care about a relationship, right. I need to say it. And, right. and then and I was ex ex pleasantly surprised at how it yeah. was received. And yeah. I'm no pro at it, don't get me wrong. It just, but it, I'm just echoing what you said. That yeah. seemed to help. And, yeah. um, and one of the things I would say, too, is you want to be careful of your words. Your words give you your life. And so um, it sounds like you handled that wonderfully. And I also just want to say that, because uh, people say things are hard, right? Having these conversations are hard. Right. Um, and that's just made up, <laughs> right? I mean, this is pretty hard. Um, this is not nearly as hard. Um, but if you say to yourself and say to others, this conversation is going to be hard, that for many people can just be the stopping point. Mm. You set yourself up, yeah. So you can say it's, um, I ran a marathon, I don't know if anybody else ever did, and when I was running it, I was like, this is really hard. And my friend who I was training with said, just think of it as different. <laughs> and and, after, you, your and feelings, after you smacked your friend. Yes. <laughs> it's just, it just, it feels different, that's all. Yeah. So it could be an awkward conversation, but I encourage people to not think of it as a, as a hard conversation, because it could just prevent them from even being started. You know, I thought you were going to say that it's harder not to have the conversation. Like, or maybe it costs more, but, but I see what you're saying, yeah. yeah. There's certainly a big cost to not having it, and part of it is, you know, if you do somebody wrong, I, I think about an example. Um, this gentleman who uh, was ranting and raving 
about how his manager had disrespected him, you know, three years before. Just. And so I call the manager and, of course, relay to him. And what does he say? What does he say about the story? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> three years ago, right? So this gentleman, and I, I guarantee all of us have this in our lives. Um, there's a story that offended us in some way, that hurt us. Mm. And we've been carrying that around. And the other person's sleeping just fine at night. <laughs> you know, it's like we swallow this, this poison pill and we expect the other person to die. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's, it, we're the ones who suffer. Mm. And so for me, it's, you know, either have the conversation or let it go. Mm. You know, it's typically about the other person. It's typically not really about us. So, yeah. so let it go. How did you switch in that example going to the hospital where you were enraged and how did you make that move yeah. to, to uh, uh, open your mind a bit more? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I know right here and I had to put here was um, me pulling my sword out is not going to do anybody any good. Um, and that what I wanted to, uh, uh, we're all on the same team. And that's one of the things Trying I'll say. Trying to help say. your mom's care. Yeah, yeah, we're all on the same team. And that's one of the things that I, 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 I talk about that's so important is um, with your coworkers. You know, if my coworker says or does something that I find offensive in some way or disagree with, um, if I actually care about that person as an individual, care about the organization, respect the I should become really curious as to, gee, I wonder why that person has a different take on things. Um, because we should all fundamentally be aligned to the mission of the organization. And so in my talk, why are we here? We're all here to support the mission. And in this case, the mission was my mom's health. And I had to really believe that that's you know, where he was coming from. And so to say, um, you know, I, 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 I know how important it is for you to help my mom. And I just need to understand you know, what, why there's this change that's going on. And, mm. you know, and it was just, it was very responsive to that. So it sounds like a part of the answer is having an intentional moment yeah. of stopping and pausing and do a little introspection as yeah. opposed to just come in with guns blazing. But it is an interesting question. Like we're all smart. We could figure out the concept pretty quickly. I, yeah. I, I really use visual. So I really see myself as leaving it outside the room. Like a visual imagery to you. Just take the anger that's inside of you. Mm -hmm and leave it, and the other way is to instill yourself with faith. Mm -hmm. Which can right. help do both, yeah. yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm working with a group of, cardi of cardiovascular surgeons, a practice of doctors, and um, they don't really know what their core values are. Hmm. Just don't know, you know, they have a sense. So we're gonna get a, a team together of, of the receptionist and some nursing staff and some of the doctors and we're having conversations about who are we, who do we want to be, mm -hmm. and what are those values. And then in terms of process, um, that's got to be built in. It's got to do an internal marketing strategy actually depending on the size of the organization. But then at the, at the start of every meeting, you know, whether you do morning huddle meetings or weekly team meetings, you know, the most concrete example is if you're in a construction company, every morning there's a meeting, you talk about safety. So at the beginning of every meeting that you have, maybe you take one aspect of a value and make it that value for the month, and then you have to wreck it. You'll never get the behavior you want by focusing on the behavior you don't want. Actually, say that again. That's one of the big points in your book here. Unpack yeah. that. So you'll never get the behavior that you want. It doesn't matter if you're your child, your employee, or your um, pet. You never get the behavior you want by focusing on the behavior that you don't want. So you only, foc you only get the behavior you want by focusing on the behavior that you want. Um, and so, so give us an example of that. Well, so acknowledging people for if you see them going above and beyond with a client, it's, it's thank you for that contribution. It, like we can go on and on about these things, but I always think about every individual and what if there was what change in their behavior would make the biggest impact. And that's the one I want to pay attention to. But to your question is to say, all right, we got to keep this alive. How are we going to do that? Mm. And so to recognize and acknowledge people, um, you know, at a team level, uh, there, there are lots of different ways to do it.
Okay, so my primary thesis is that um, respect leads to engagement. And so if you think about a time in your life when you have really felt respected by your manager, your leader, you want to give them what you have, right? You're going to work harder because you feel respected by them and you respect them. Um, when there's a loss of respect, so either I've, I disrespect you for something you've done or I feel um, that you don't respect, I disengage, like behaviorally, emotionally, psychologically. So what I would say is if you have an employee who all of a sudden has a drop off in productivity, it really could be related to an issue of respect hmm. and to have some conversation about that. So I, I, I'm a behaviorist by training, so I'm looking for changes in behavior and tying it oftentimes to the feeling, a, a feeling of disrespect. So would you actually say to, to take a particular person, so if you know that someone's performance or engagement has dropped, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them? And come, yeah, and come from the place of, look, I really care about you. I really authentically care about you being successful and, and, and this team, and I've just, you know, what I've noticed is there's, there's some changes here. And I'd um, like to have a conversation you with, with you. People, when, <clears throat> people fundamentally, I think, want to be productive in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about motivation and employee engagement and all that, but I think fundamentally you want to do a good job. Mm. And when we stop doing a good job, something's going on. And it could be something personal, and they may or may not choose to share that with you. But don't avoid the conversation because somehow, that's what this whole, 42 tips is about is how do you, it helps you to have the conversation, not avoid the conversation. Yeah. And in one of the things you wrote that Paul also said, when you have that conversation, the person say, have I done something to um, disrespect you or to uh, uh, make, somehow impact, yeah. am I part of the problem? Own it. Yeah. As opposed to assuming that it's the employee who's just not doing her or his job. Yeah. So I do a lot, I'm sure many of you know, the 360 assessments, right? So I start with the leaders and asking, do you feel, asking people, do you feel respected by the leader? And most people, if you ask that question, will say, yes, I treat people with respect. Like their self-image, you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. their self-image. I mean, most people don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I really enjoy being a jerk. <laughs> like, most people don't set their day out, right, yeah. to offend others. Right. Um, but the problem is the higher you go in an organization, the less likely it is that you are to get critical feedback. And so these kind of assessments, I think, are really helpful in pointing out. So people, leaders may get terribly offended, like, I, you know, I can't believe. And it, it's like, I, I get it. You don't mean to be disrespectful. But let's look at the behaviors that you're engaging in that would lead other people to that interpretation. Um, yeah. Well, let's say we're a couple notches below this leader who's not modeling respect. Uh, do you just give up the ghost or is there a, within your sphere of influence with yeah. your domain of what you do and whom you work with and who works for you, can you still, can you be an island of hope amidst yeah. everything else? Yeah, I mean, I just think and it, there's a, one passage in here about being a role model and just staying true to yourself and who you are and don't become self-righteous about it either. Right. But just like a Christian, you just should be living your life in a particular manner. And if you believe that respect is kind of the right thing to do, and be, then just live your life that way. Yeah. So a friend of mine has me go into her third grade classroom and read Madeline. And when you walk in, one of the guiding principles was respect. And so I finished reading, this little boy raises his hand and says, are you a teacher? And I go, no, no, I'm not a teacher. And I go, actually, I am. I teach people, adults, about respect. And he looks at me with the innocence of a seven-year-old and goes, well, why do they forget? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so out of the mouths of babes, right? Um, so yeah, isn't it a shame? I mean, that it, that's what it takes is I don't think it should. We all want to be loved and respected. Like it's both. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's an either both. or. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think they, they go hand in hand. I think it goes back to the idea of respect um, is, is really an issue of, of safety. Hmm. Um, because when we're respected, we're, we're safe. And so hmm. feeling, I'll say, interpersonal relationship 
matters more for some people than for others. And how we show respect to people certainly differs from individuals. So you may have somebody, I had a woman who worked for me and it was just really important for her to let me know what was going on in her family and her life on a regular basis. And that was just, it mattered to her. So connecting to her on that level. So your listening was a sign of respect for that for right. her, right. And a sign of caring, right? right? You know, one of my favorite quotes is, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. One of the, uh, my mentor now deceased is uh, John Stott. Some of you may have known him. Uh, when Karen and I lived in London, we worshiped at All Souls Church where he was the, the rector emeritus. And, um, uh, and many people, if you don't know him, said if Protestants had a pope, it would be John Stott. He just had that sort of integrity and, uh, and authenticity and, and an intellect. But he, he, he once preached on this very passage, mm. and, and he made the, the hermeneutical move, the interpretive move, to say it's about mutual respect and mutual love. Mm. And then he unpacked that <laughs> theologically. Mm -hmm. uh, and being consistent with, because when you try to interpret a difficult passage in the Bible, what, what, what theologians will tell you is first look at the text, then look at it within its context, mm. and then look at it in light of the gospel. Mm. And that can take some challenging texts and have us find fresh ways to still honor the text, but put it to make sure it's consistent with the gospel. So when Jesus says male and female, Jew and Gentile are all created alike, and mm. the foundational texts were all created in God's image, it's, those are good places to go on that. Um, and for, we all know about the culture of an organization. I spoke about the culture of where we live and how we treat each other. So if you think about the culture, culture drives behaviors and attitudes, and those behaviors and attitudes reinforce the culture. So if people say hello and good morning to each other, how they treat one another is very much related to the culture of the organization. But what you want to think about is where is that culture coming from? And it should be driven by the values of the organization. Um, and I won't go into great depth, but you have a uh, Color Me company I started after 9-11 um, to give back to, um, uh, to charity. And um, one of the reasons I share that with you is because I was extremely intentional about what the values are of that organization. And what I found is that really guided my decision making. Mm. You know, and I'll just real yeah. quickly. Like, what, so what's the elevator speech the, description of what color uh, color me was? So there were uh, products that were um, drawn by children, um, and so for this particular case, right, take fabric markers, uh, draw it. You know, you could have kids sleepovers, put the names of the kids, the dates, and um, yeah, color them and put them in the dryer. Um, so we had all kinds. We we were very patriotic, so we did lots of cards over the troops. We had a saying that freedom isn't free, but saying thank you is. Um, here's our little stocking. I did not color this one in, but it just gives you a sense of something that's colored in. <laughs> the nativity in. set, yeah. Yeah, so we had a, a number of different SKUs and, um, and really blessed the, we actually set in the Wall Street Journal as an example of small companies that gave back to their, their communities. Well, in fact, you gave, and this is a culture question, at a, that because it was you were the owner of the company, yeah. that uh, they gave 10% of their gross, not net, gross Proceed, income, yeah. gross sales, to charitable organizations, yeah. uh, I mean, that's that's a big deal. It's a whole other story. I love. I know we're. But you tried to time. you tried to articulate right what, what you like what you wanted the company to stand for, right? Yeah. And you put it to words. So. And one of the things I said in there, um, in the guiding philosophical principles, is we're truly blessed to have these opportunities. So I always looked at it every day. I would come into work, and I still do. Um, it's the bi the biggest blessing I think we have in the world that's been given to us is the ability to make a difference. I really believe that, and that we can make a difference every day. Yeah. Any wisdom you'd give for where they're empty words, and they're beautiful words, but no one knows them? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, look, most of the people in this room are leaders in some way. And I think that you should, I think the thing to go back is to look at those values and say, do they still speak to our organization? Do they still matter? Mm -hmm. um, and if they do, start taking a look at, are they really aligned with the behaviors of how we live our yeah. life? And in this organization. Yeah, because um, yeah, we all have a sphere of influence, no matter how small it may just be our coworkers, uh, and wherever we are in the, in the food chain of an organization, or we may be the person in the corner of us. So we all, we all can make a difference with people we're interacting with. Yeah. Maybe even just being aware that everyone yeah. else has a different personal definition of respect. Uh, 
that you know, if you diss me or whatever, whether you know, we think of these sort of phrases, is just being respectful is being aware of how people might right. have different receiving right. ways of re receiving respect. So just that alertness is a big step. Yeah, so it's really interesting to study respect cross-culturally. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Because some behaviors that are considered respectful in one culture would be disrespectful in another culture. And so my advice is to, with your own staff um, or even family, um, is to say, you know, it's always my intention to treat you with respect. And if you feel as though I've not done that, my request is you let me know that. So mm. I have the opportunity to clean that up. Mm. And not wait three years. All right, or 40. <laughs> yeah. In your family growing up, so yeah. uh, what, was it a deeply religious family, or was that part of your D in the family conversation, or what's the story there? So my, my parents were both raised Catholic, and um, we're from the New York area, and went out to central New Jersey, and I live on a 100-acre horse farm. And so uh, if anybody has ever grown up on a farm, has anyone ever grown up on a farm? Okay, not in Greenwich, not a lot. Okay. <laughs> so um, my father, being first generation Italian American, had an expression that if you wanted to eat seven days a week, you worked seven days a week. And <laughs> indeed we did. Everyone was like, oh, it must be so much fun to grow up on a farm. <laughs> not so much. So, uh, but you know, when we were, we were born and my parents were working seven days a week, you know, 18 hours a day. And they, came, they were humble. I mean, they had no money when they came over. This no. is a classic rags oh, to yeah, yeah. whatever story. Totally, right? yeah. yeah. So um, we, when we, I have an identical twin brother. And when we were born, my parents went to uh, have us baptized. And the priest refused to because they were not part of the congregation. Wow. Uh, and so that was an interesting start. Uh, and then we were not raised in any kind of faith. Right. And so Catholic roots, but no practice of any sort. No. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the first Bible I ever had was my freshman year of college, um, you know, taking a humanities curriculum and, um, and being almost failing it. Uh, <laughs> it's like, what prophet said this? I'm like, I have no idea. Um, so, uh, but I became very interested uh, in religion uh, throughout college and was raised, I guess, in what I would call an agnostic just wasn't aware, didn't know. Um, one of the things that clicked for me, you know, I think we all find our way to God through different pa uh, passages, um, was the thought of what would I believe in so strongly that I would be unwilling to give up um, hmm. to avoid being eaten alive by a lion? <laughs> would you mind saying that again? What would I well, believe in so, so strongly? Well, how how yeah. would it be, right, how would it be that somebody said, here's your choice. You can either renounce this, huh. or you're going to be killed. Right. Which has happened and still happens in parts of the yeah. world. Yeah. So who, who, who are these people that their faith is so strong hmm. Hmm. that they would be willing to you know, say, I believe this, hmm. and if, you know, if the consequence of that. Including death. Including death. Wow. Um, I'm OK with that. Hmm. You know? hmm. So. After that, I ended up at, at graduate school, and uh, one of my old graduate school friends is here this morning. Oh, terrific. Surprising to me, so great to see Mitch. Um, and they say oftentimes you find God in a foxhole, and I had a, a personal crisis, and um, so I turned to God, and um, I had a friend who um, was a churchgoer, and, uh, and I said, I, I feel like I need to go to church. I'm not exactly sure why, but it feels like that's where I need to go. And so um, she brought me to a Presbyterian church. And did and you have this amazing experience? I had this very odd experience. <laughs> um, because people were standing up, they were singing things, they were saying things, they were shaking hands. I'm like, this was really, really out of my comfort zone. <laughs> and so after the service, I'm like, OK, God, I think we're good. Let's go back to our regular life. And um, I got uh, back to my uh, house. and. Uh, my friend had driven me, and I go to reach for my keys, and they're gone, right? So I've lost my keys. And so I'm like, I really did not want to go back to that church because mm. I felt like I was good, you know? <laughs> and uh, went back, and I started asking people, did anybody find keys or such? And they said, well, if anybody did, it would be our, our minister. 
So I go up, and it was this great big man. And um, quite frankly, I, I never had a wonderful relationship with men in my life. Um, my dad was very much a disciplinarian. So uh, anyway, uh, I went up, and Blair was about six foot six. And he actually lived in Stanford, and uh, big beard. And I said, uh, you know, I heard you maybe found my keys. And he said, yes. And then he, he shook my hand, and he looked at me, and he said, I hope we see you again. I hope we see you again. Yeah. And it was the most sincere, authentic thing that anyone's ever said to me. Hmm. And there was just this incredible sense of warmth. Hmm. Like, wow, he really means that. Hmm. And so um, then I just started going and got involved in Began Bible study and, and you know, then ended up being baptized. Oh. Um, and that was 20-something uh, years ago. Well, I appreciate you sharing. It's a very personal story, and I appreciate that. It's, it's a good reminder to, to all of us that the way we share the story is sometimes through the simplest of gestures uh, and, the, and just with kindness. Uh, and you know, Christianity has a, uh, as some of you know, the, sort of this trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and sometimes the Spirit moves. And Judaism has the same concept, actually, not of Father, Son, but, but of, of Ruach, the sense of, of, of wind, of breathing that is going through, that is the Holy Spirit in some way taking an accidental event and making it not so accidental mm -hmm. and very special. But, but thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, of course. Let's give Paul just a great round of applause. Thank you.